Hi there, guys. My name is Father Francis McKee. I'm pastor here in Montreal. And um, each week I'm giving my parishioners a message of hope during this pandemic. And for the next four weeks, I'm going to be speaking about the book of the Apocalypse. You know, during, um, during times of, uh, of fear, pandemics, wars, the book of the Apocalypse becomes very, very popular. And uh, people use it. I'm, I've, been, I've been, actually what, what motivated me is I'm hearing a lot of uh, people on the YouTubes talking about the apocalypse is happening now and the devil's coming out, the Antichrist is here, and, and, and this is a realization of the prophecy of, of the apocalypse. And it's, it's, it's a whole lot of nonsense. I mean, not all of it, obviously. Some are making some sense, but some are saying a lot of nonsense about the end of the world and this is the end of everything. And uh, it's a very popular theme, you know, whenever there's people are fearful, and uh, so I'd like to talk, uh, to, I'm going to be offering, actually, this is part of a Bible study for my parishioners. We'll discuss uh, the content of my little talks here. But you're very welcome to uh, listen in and um, pick up something from it. Just a bit of a disclaimer, I, I don't have a PhD in scripture. I'm not a biblical scholar per se, but I've been uh, studying and, and, and teaching scripture for many, many years. I would say about 40 years now. I've been a priest for 30, 33, but as a teenager, I already began uh, doing a bit of Bible teaching then. And, uh, and I've uh, studied with uh, Bishop Collins and with uh, Bishop Gervais of Ottawa, the emeritus bishop there, and uh, uh, especially the, the Book of the Apoc Apocalypse, which, about which they wrote quite a bit a number of years ago. Uh, there's a father, a famous French uh, priest, Father Ansem Lompré, who uh, gave me a wonderful, wonderful insight onto the book of the Apocalypse. And uh, they all more or less jived and said similar, similar kind of things. And uh, of course, you know, I've used the regular text that Catholic priests use to, um, to understand these kind of books. And actually, the book of the Apocalypse is really not a complicated book. It's actually quite simple. It's actually a simple little book uh, which has a basic message. Life is going to be at times really tough, but don't lose hope because of Christ is with us. That's, that's the heart of the message. If you want to dig a little deeper, part of the message of the book of the Apocalypse is like, wake up, guys. Don't you see? Like, if you've lost the sense of God, get back on track. That's kind of what he's saying, you know. And so I'm going to do a, a series of four talks here um, in which uh, I'm just going to give a bit of background today. And then uh, next uh, next presentation will be how to, how to read parts of the book of the Apocalypse, because it's actually meant to reach more at your emotions than your head. That's what St. John, what we say St. John, we're not really ex exactly sure who wrote that Apocalypse, but it's certainly somebody from the St. John, the Johannine community, we call it. Uh, he was really intent more on using the apocalyptic style of literature that was very common among the Jews the first century before Jesus, as a, a means to awaken strong emotions in people, both of fear and of hope. Fear inviting to conversion and inviting to hope. That was really his purpose. And if he were living today, he probably would have made a movie is what he would have done. In fact, if I were to say uh, that a contemporary version of the book of the apocalypse today uh, that exists would be the, the, what we call the Lord of the Rings. I don't know how many of you have seen this movie, but the Lord of the Rings is a, um, is a, is a wonderful story uh, put together by J.J. Tolkien, who, as some of you may know, was a very well-read and uh, recognized Catholic biblical scholar. He knew the scriptures very well. And so his story is not just a fantasy story. In his story of the Lord of the Rings, he's trying to awaken in people something like, and I suspect Tolkien was probably thinking of the book of the Apocalypse when he wrote his story. Now, I'm just guessing here. But it has a very similar flavor. You know, if the, 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 the Lord of the Rings is, is really quite a, uh, an, a powerful movie. You know, you go from high emotions of fear when you see this you know, humongous spider coming down and you're about to attack Frodo and Sam and somehow they escape out of all that, you know. And um, in that particular story, then, uh, 
uh, through the apocalypse, we see the orcs coming, and we see elves coming, and we see the we see the 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 the, the battle of, of of good and evil in that. And all through that, Sam and Frodo just kind of keep trucking along, and they slip here and they fall there, and they keep moving, and and somehow they get support from the angels, and they and they're always battling with the ring, the temptation to do wrong, temptation to evil fighting it through their lifetime, you might say. And at the end of all this battle, it finishes with the vision of the new Jerusalem. You know, they're walking around, and everybody's applauding for them and all that kind of thing. That's exactly what St. John had in mind, something similar to that. He wanted to awaken through emotion and through the power of emotion, fear and awaken in us hope. Fear to wake up a kind of a sense of conversion in us, so we could reconnect with the Lord. The Apocalypse as a book has had enormous impact over the years, you know. Um, in, in music, uh, musicians have used the, word of the, the words of the Apocalypse, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. That's Handel, who, uh, who used that in his, uh, used a lot of uh, the Apocalypse in his music and, and others. Uh, Bach and others have used the apocryphal language. Um, in France, in the uh, Chateau de, de Angers, there's about 30 tapestries, huge, that were sewn together of scenes of the apocalypse all around there because this, this book has captured the imagination of peoples over the centuries. Um, and in times, a set of fear, especially, it becomes particularly popular. And there's always some kind of preachers going around who will be saying, I told you, it's the apocalypse now. The devil is coming out. The end of the world's around the corner. Here it is. Here are the signs. It's all a lot of BS, really. But it is true that the difficult times are an invitation to challenge. If, in fact, this was true, that it was the end of the world, then, for example, in the apocalypse in chapter 20, verse 7, when it says this, listen carefully, when the thousand years are completed, Satan, the devil, will be released from prison and prowl the earth. Now, what do you think about that? The people in the year 999, Christians in Europe, read the Apocalypse, and they saw that text that said, in the year 1000, the devil is coming out from under the earth to prowl on now, you can imagine the terror going through the people. My God, he's coming. Let's go. We're going to go. And so they started building Gothic, Gothic cathedrals. They started building churches everywhere. They became very religious. Of course. Why? Because the devil was coming. And he didn't come. Well, I mean, he's the evil one is always prowling around. I mean, we're always obviously struggling with, with sin in our lives. But there was nothing particular that happened in terms of a presence of the devil coming out of the world, coming into the world at that time. So it wasn't the end of the world, even though the preachers of the time were saying he's coming. No. Or, for example, during the bubonic plague in the year 1350, when 500 million people died. And people were saying, this is it. It's the end of the world. The apocalypse is here. But life continued. It was very painful, but it continued. And then we think about the Spanish influenza. There's another moment where we think of, uh, you know, the, the fears around um, the year 2020 with the coronavirus. And everybody says, that's it. That's the sign. The apocalypse is here. No, it's not. But it is an invitation. God is always inviting us to conversion. And sometimes the invitation can be a little bit more intense. That's for sure. Because the real pandemic of our own times has not really been the coronavirus. The real pandemic of our times for the last 34 years has been the pandemic of the absence of God in people's lives. And so the book of the Apocalypse, uh, the first three chapters are, not, are, are sort of what we call traditional prophetic li literature. You know, just basically the writer says to the bishops of the area, uh, writes to seven different bishops and says, look, straighten out your life, will you? Or... You're doing great. Hang in there. Don't quit. Or, I know you're going through a tough time. Don't let go. And then chapter 4 through to 21, he changes his style of prophetic literature into something very graphic and full of strange beasts and animals 
and it goes through ups and downs of terror and fear and hallelujah, everything's okay, and terror and fear and everything's going hallelujah. It's kind of like it goes through waves, you know, and his purpose is to kind of awaken in people a sense of hope and, a, and, a, and, a, and an ability to kind of keep moving when times are difficult. Now we need to, so he uses strange language. Now why would he use that? It was very common, uh, what we call apocalyptic language, it was very common uh, a century before the coming of Jesus as a new method. I'll talk about that in a, in a subsequent talk there. As a new way of presenting scriptural language um, through symbolism and through uh, symbolic numbers and colors. Why? Why? Let me give an example of what I mean by that, what, so you'll understand better. When I was a seminary, and I had a friend who was from Vietnam. Now, the time of when I was back in the seminary, back in the 80s, Vietnam was still very much communist. It still is now, but it was even more so and rigorous, you know. And uh, any letter that was sent out in uh, Vietnam out to family outside of the country was automatically checked. Every letter was checked and thrown in the garbage if you were saying something that was against the communist regime. And so the, the Vietnamese developed a symbolic language to send messages to their family members outside of Vietnam to say, you know, somebody's died, we're doing okay, we're really hungry, uh, we're trying to escape, or something like that. It was always in symbolic language. So the government officials would read it and say, ah, don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, just give them the letter. And so, for example, my buddy, Vietnamese buddy, told me that his his friend, his brother had escaped from Vietnam, and I, he read to me what the letter said, and it didn't make any sense to me. It said something about his buddy, his brother had been on a canoe ride uh, through, the Amazon, through the Amazon or something like that. He said, no, no, that's the symbolic language that meant he just escaped. Okay. So that's exactly what the writer of the Apocalypse does. He's writing, let me give you the historical context, okay? The writer of the Apocalypse is writing, St. John, is writing to Christians who are living in Rome, particularly. And in Rome, they were being severely persecuted. There was a lot of Christians in Rome. And as you know, Nero had been... Uh, accusing, um, it was probably written during the time of Domitian, but it may have taken a number of years for the writer of the Apocalypse to write it. And during the time of Nero, the around 60 uh, AD, in the time of Domitian around, <clears throat> uh, Emperor Domitian around the year 86 to 95, um, the persecution of Christians, you know, by, by being human torches, by being lit as human torches, by being destroyed by animals for, for fun halftime shows during their, their activities, um, being raped, being terrorized, was just awful. It was just awful. The Christians were terrorized and fearful. And the reason they're being terrorized is because both Nero and also Domitian and various Neros, but at, uh, various Caesars, but especially Domitian and, and Nero, were particularly violent because they insisted that everybody worship them as God. In fact, Domitian was actually not a bad administrator, Domitian. He was uh, the brother of Titus who destroyed Jerusalem. And uh, when he became emperor, he was a good administrator, but he was a what we call a micromanager and an evil micromanager. And he didn't want anybody worshiping anything than the Roman gods, you know. And he was the first, and he also built um, he built a temple to his brother Titus and to his dad Vespasian and asked people to come and worship them as gods. And he wanted people to worship Minerva. Minerva was the goddess that he loved very much. And as well, Jupiter. That was his favorite, uh, favorite god, was Jupiter. And so he set temples up all over the place, and he said to the Jews and to the Christians, because Jews were, committed, were, were persecuted just as much, and said, you can do whatever you want but you must worship these, and you cannot contradict that. And of course, Jews and Christians said, we will be good citizens, but we're not going to follow that lifestyle, and we're certainly not going to enter into the, 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 the degrading Roman lifestyle, uh, whatever form it takes, because Christians have made a choice to walk with Christ in a different kind of way, as the Jews have decided to follow Adonai as well. 
And so Jews and especially Christians were being severely persecuted. And so John, and so the temptation to quit and say, okay, 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 wait, don't, don't take my mother, don't, don't, uh, don't rape her, or don't take my sister and crucify her, or don't take my, my, my brother or my uncle and, 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 and burn him alive. Okay, I'll give in to you, no problem. The temptation to give in and to apostatize and to quit was very strong. And John wanted them to understand that the resurrection of Christ is real. It's as real as your very breath. It's as real as life itself. Don't give in. And even if the worst happens and you get destroyed and persecuted, Christ has got the victory and you will share in that victory. Don't give up. That was his message. Now, if he'd written in, a, in, his, in his apocalypse and said, look, you know, the Romans are going to get wiped out anyway. And you know that uh, ultimately Christ is going to win and the Roman Empire will sooner or later disappear because John was an older man and he had lived a long time and he'd seen civilizations come and civilizations go. He'd seen emperors come and emperors go. He'd seen great people come and great people go. He knew that nothing was going to stay forever and the Roman Empire was going to disappear too. And so he just said to the Christians, hang in there. The Roman Empire, which is crucifying you right now, is not going to last very long. And Domitian is not God. And, and Jupiter is not God either. Hang on to the true God and you will find life, even if you the worst comes to worst, that you should die through this. And so he was writing to them this. But if he'd written it in, in plain Latin and said, the Roman Empire is going to disappear, Domitian is going to disappear and, and die soon, don't worry about him. The persecution would have simply intensified. And so he came up with this uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic language style of writing this thing symbolically through numbers, through colors, and he basically through those symbols, and, and I'll explain them the next time as well, what some of the numbers mean, but through numbers and colors, he basically says, look guys, you know, this Roman Empire is going to disappear. And he gave a name to the Roman Empire, in fact, and that would be the first symbol I'll give you right now. The, the, symbol he, the name he gave this to, the, to the Roman Empire was Babylon. Well, you've heard Babylon, right? Of course, the, the Babylon, the whore of Babylon. Why would he give the name Babylon? Because the writer of the Apocalypse was a biblical scholar who knew the scripture, the Hebrew scriptures very well. He was a remarkably scholarly, this person. And he drew from the Old Testament images that the Christians would know, that the Jews would know, and draw their conclusions from what they heard. They knew that Babylon was the great enemy of the Jews because in the 5th century before the coming of Jesus, Bab the Babylonians, the Iraqis, the Babylonians had destroyed the Jews, had destroyed the temple, had destroyed Jerusalem, and had ripped them away from the land and brought them into exile out there. And the people were suffering terribly during that time. And then within 50 years, along came Cyrus, the Persian king and said, go back home and build your temple back again. It was all finished. The terrible tragedy was over. And so the symbolism of, of Babylon became then for the Christians and for the Jews, it became a kind of a symbol of the, uh, of the power uh, of evil that was destroying them and which would disappear one day. And so St. John calls so the Roman Empire Babylon as the very, which, which comes as practically the, the, very, the very power of the devil himself, you know, destroying the Christians. And his message to them is really very simple. His message to the Christians is very simple, guys. He says, you know, evil and problems and difficulties will come constantly. Do not let go. Keep your eyes fixed on the Lord. Wars and plagues and pandemics will come and they will go. Guys, for those of you who think the pandemic of coronavirus is going to be the last one, it won't. There will be others. For those who say the, the Second World War was the last war, there will be others. I mean, it's tragic to think that, but there will be. There will be because human history only lasts 80 years, the length of every human life. And then we got to start the lesson all over again. So we never do learn because life keeps coming and going. And so the basic message is, 
hang in there and keep going. And the Catholic Mass is actually remarkably built around the apocalyptic message, you know. And I, I'll get into that a little bit more. But when you look at the Mass, holy, holy, holy. Let's sing with all the angels and saints. Holy, holy, holy. Yeah, this is the apocalyptic stuff. Behold, the Lamb of God, who is in the center of the church. All of you bow down and worship the Lamb of God. That's straight out of the apocalypse, you know. And, and in a sense, too, the, the week is built around that kind of image as well. You know, Monday through Saturday, you go to work, you have problems, you have difficulty with your boss, and Sunday you come and everything's calm in the church and you worship God and say, everything's under control. That's how the apocalypse works. There'll be difficulties and problems. Don't let go. Hang in there. Christ is victorious. Keep your eyes fixed on him. So I'll say more about it the next time, guys. But this is a bit of an introduction to the, uh, to the apocalypse. I'll come back on it a little bit more. Um, but I'd like to encourage you before the next time uh, to start to read a little bit of it. Start from chapter 4 because chapter 1, 2, and 3 is really a more traditional prophetic message there. Um, and St. John gives us a very simple message. You know, you'll see the, the, the rough stuff and all of a sudden he'll turn to Hallelujah, let's sing praise and glory to God. So, courage, guys. I'll, uh, section 2 will continue the development of this uh, apocalyptic language. The Lord bless you. He loves you immensely. He's with us. Trust him through all we live. No, this is not the end of the world. It's just one more difficulty we'll have to weather together. Have a nice day.